Hey, let us start the last thing of the year for Thursday, December 24th, Christmas Eve 2020. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Test. That was pretty good. I approve. You, yeah, yeah. You know, the one we had last week, we thought was going to be our new canonical intro, but had to had to try something new. That was a last minute submission in December by Dan Simpson out there. Thank you so much, listener Dan, for sending in that intro. And that is like a whole, at least half year of new intros we've tried out. I think we're not going to listen through them all publicly for the episode, but uh, the winner, I think, through our unanimous consent is uh, the one we had last week. Yeah, that one was pro- it's probably my favorite still. Agree? Do you want to play it? Do we, should we play it? Should we play it just, uh, just so people can hear it? it this is yeah. highly yeah. unorthodox. Okay, here it goes. Uh, I believe. Oh, no, I don't even have it. Is it less reverb? I believe it's all oh, this is really embarrassing. If it's not this one. I believe it's this one. Wait, you guys can't hear it. I need to share my music. Uh, yeah, it is this one. Okay, here goes. This is the winner. Our new intro. We could have just announced it in the coming in the, in the first episode of the year, but here it goes by Less Reverb. Congratulations. Thank you so much for submitting this one way back in August. But our final new intro. Here we go. <laughs> It just sounds so nice. I, it, it feels right. It's not too chip y It has good energy to it. Under 30 seconds. Well done, Less Reverb. Well done to everyone out there, the, including the ones who, uh, the folks who submitted heavy metal intros. Kishore really appreciated that. Uh, we're doing something special this week because it's the end of the year. We don't really want to talk about news. We don't really want to talk about all. There's, there's no giant HBO Max or Disney announcement. Uh, to go over as we have in the past couple episodes. So we're just going to talk about two things, and they are spoiler-filled. Now, the first thing we want to talk about, I think in this order, it's going to be Mandalorian Season 2, not only the finale and all the things that happened in the finale, but maybe a recap and a a retrospective of the the season as a whole, what we thought about it. Uh, And if you want to stick around, we're also going to be diving in, trying to understand and wrap our brains around christopher nolan's tenant which is uh as of last week available to purchase and as of i believe in the new year available to rent on digital services so all three of us have watched all the above so let's dive right in no musical intros wait no wait we do have mando talk don't we oh i don't have it were you not here for mando talk i don't think so oh my god okay someone fill time i need to find mando talk (laughs) well how are you guys this doing? This is the first, I think we're five minutes in to this podcast and the first time I'm actually saying anything. So that's a new record. Uh, I'm excited for the year to come to an end. I don't want to be like one of those people that's <laughs> like, oh, 2020 was the worst. But like, seriously, let's let's put a bow on this one. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Jeremy, anything, any, any, any words, any first words for the end of the year? What are you searching for? I'm I'm searching for the SoundCloud that it was sent. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is turning into a family Zoom call where I'm telling my parents how to, like, operate. (laughs) All right. We're going to go into our first segment. And this is Mando Talk. Play. Mando Talk. <laughs> that's great it's great uh and that was created by Mazkill, and it turns out even though we speculated that it might have been sampling the soundtrack all original music wow. by Mazkill. so we are nice clear work. of the uh, the copyright bots okay can i say it just on the subject of mando somebody um i know purchased the sideshow collectibles grogu 
and shared photos. Have you seen this? Wait, wait. You, Share- the one I brought, I, I had like in my arms for that episode. Did you buy it? Yeah. I, we that was the whole, one? The, the life-size one, right? Life-size with, Baby Yoda? Mm-hmm. It's where the skin just looks like skin. I mean, it looks amazing. Um, so it's not silicone, and we did a whole unboxing. Uh, Sideshow actually sent us uh, sent Adam one, and we did a whole modification video about it. So it's a static figure. The head can turn. The clothing is great. It can use a little bit more weathering, uh, and I think it's a it's like a vinyl. So it's a tinted vinyl. So it's not a paint mm. application. Um, it just that's the color that kind of um, aquamarine green greenish Yoda color. <laughs> Uh, obviously, but it's pop- a translucent material. It right? is. I mean, it, it yeah. looks really good. Yeah, and it has a magnetic ball that it comes with that yep. attaches to his hand. Yep. So we Super did a whole clever. modification where we disassembled uh, Grogu, took his arms off, and like cut into him so we can put an armature into his arm, a wire armature, so his hands can pose and and hmm. raise and do a little force pose. I have him in my living room wearing a Santa hat and you know force force pulling <laughs> some some cookies. So that's that's yeah. perfect. That's perfect. It's, it's a, it's I'm great. always cre- a little creeped out by the hair on the on these figures because it is like pretty damn realistic. Uh, yeah, fully punched hair. I think the only thing uh, now watching season two that I think they didn't do was um, put the hair on the ears as well. Grogu has mm. some pretty pretty like uh, visible fuzz on his ears, and he's a young fifty. Give yeah. him give him some time. He'll he'll grow some hair. I just thought it was like remarkably realistic. Like that, a lot of their the sideshow stuff, while incredibly detailed, still looks sort of like a painted caricature. You know, it doesn't look real. Whereas, like I think Grogu just lends itself to their art, and it came out it came out so good. It, it, one of the reasons I think for that is because they had access to the original mold. So the puppet Grogu was made by Legacy Effects. It's a silicone puppet. And the prototype that I saw when I went down the sideshow over in July was a casting from that mold, silicone. So silicone, translucent, it has that real fleshy look, right? It, it looks so it's like lifelike. And it's not a computer model, then, you know, tooled and then injection molded. Uh, but the the manufactured prop that they made uh, because of the materials they chose, I think it's uh, that vinyl, that soft softish vinyl, and then that tinting and a little bit of that red blush color. Uh, yeah, it looks it looks like mm. a real thing. Yeah, yeah, w- high, highly recommended. Uh, and and I think they're still selling those at Sideshow Collectibles. Okay, the finale, the rescue, chapter sixteen. Do we want to jump right into spoilers, or how do we want to do this? We didn't really. Well, I mean the whole the whole podcast is spoiler territory, right? I yeah. Mean, if you haven't seen this, and you might just not want to tread here yet, because and then regroup once you have. Maybe before we, I bring out the spoiler light. Uh, and overall, how would you rate the season? You know, compared to the first season, were you satisfied? Were you disappointed? Surprised? You know, there were so many highs from that first season with the show being quite a surprise. And, and characters that you fell in love with, including uh, Baby Yoda, uh, the child slash Grogu. But what did you think? How did you think of the second season compared? I would say, I, I, there was higher highs in season two and lower lows. So in a way, it was more inconsistent. It was also much bigger in scope than season one. Season one was was very contained and slow and methodical uh especially uh early on building up uh the characters and then it felt like they hit the gas pedal in season two uh, so the episode uh, the jedi episode i think is the best episode of the series that came in season two uh, i also think some of the worst episodes in the series happened um here as well i i think um uh, uh the boba fett episode uh last week uh wow. it was one of the worst two, uh, two weeks of the ago series. the uh yeah. the robert two weeks ago, yeah. one yeah and, and so it, it it almost feels like it's hard to compare the seasons back and forth because they are so dramatically different in tone and scope um but i i like how they progressed the the story in season two um from where we were at the beginning to where we are at the end, it feels satisfying to have that level of progression. I don't feel like I'm just <clears> waiting <throat> for some cliffhanger. Um, I also think that this is where the Mandalorian should end. I think this should Whoa. be the end of the series. 
It's not. We'll give that away. I know it's not, they, but John I Favreau think it should be. Has already said Pedro Pascal is coming back for season three uh, that they're going to start production in uh, next year. But uh, it did, did have a finale. It, it didn't end on a cliffhanger in a sense. I mean, there were threads certainly that were left hanging. Um, but I agree that the scope was expanded. I'm a little disappointed that some of the mythology that they laid the groundwork for in the first season with the armorer and all the Mandos coming to save him and and that part you know, was really tossed by the wayside and, and, and replaced with the whole Bo-Katan uh, uh, rebels and Clone Wars era um, mythology and, and Mandalore. So um, they're way more sure of their footing, it feels like, this season, both in the storytelling and the characters are willing to put on screen, the action, the direction, and also just the, the use of their the volume technology. Uh, that some of that stuff is so seamless. So looking at the behind the scenes pictures of the planet where they go uh, to find Bo Katan, the, the water planet, right? That dock was all shot indoors on the volume and it looks completely outdoors. Uh, so I'm very impressed by the filmmaking in, in this season. Wow. I'm surprised to hear that. Uh, I, I agree with Kishore entirely that there were higher highs in this season. Uh, I, 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 don't think I disliked any of the episodes, though. I, I thought they were all great, even the the Boba one. And that, that maybe we could just attribute that to my early onset no Fs given, um, you know, philosophy towards Star Wars these days. But it's uh, it's a great philosophy to have because it's just enjoyable. And it this was the show that my son and I, you know, watched this year. There was nothing else uh, that compared to it. So, you know, it, it's a I'm so. I'm so grateful to have this in my life because <laughs> Star Wars meant a lot to me when I was a kid and you know everything that happened in the you know 20 years ago <laughs> and even what happened over the last decade haven't really lived up to it until now and I think Mandalorian's fantastic. You know one one I, way I, to oh, go ahead Jakar. I was going to say I think the one thing that is missing a little bit from season 2 that was more prevalent in season 1 was a little bit more levity uh in certain episodes so like ig11 brought a certain kind of you know fun attitude to it uh i I know it wasn't comedy but Werner herzog's performance in season one was just sort of you know unsettling in the in the kind of enjoyable way that only Werner herzog can bring to the table you had the the scout troopers you had jason stakas right and the the yes so the work taika directed we didn't get nearly that in season two and and i'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing it's just uh, i think there's a a little more brooding that happened in this season comparatively Mm. i i felt like this season seemed almost more cartoonish in a way you know what with especially when you start talking about the dark troopers um I, and maybe that's Dave Filoni's input. I don't know, but it just seemed like a little bit more fantastic and maybe less grounded in dark in the dark in darkness of like the real Star Wars. <laughs> what uh, is just, the real Star Wars? I don't know what that means. No, I, I don't mean the real Star Wars. I mean like the realness of Star Wars. It, it just this one seemed just a little bit more cartoony uh, in uh, even like the editing in this last episode when we mm. see this huge reveal, like that whole sequence leading up to the reveal was you know just over the top um Mm -hmm. cinematic in a way that you would expect from a cartoon i think before i would expect from a live action show like this um in the first season if i recall correctly the only episode where i felt like spoilers were rampant and things that something that required you to to watch the show as it debuted was the first episode when the reveal of the child and baby Yoda at the end of the episode. If, if you didn't, if you got spoiled for that, that felt like a big moment. And I guess one of the benchmarks is the second season had so many more of those and it, that didn't sit as well with me. I, and maybe that was a, um, that's due to the, some of the fan service that was in this episode, but the reveal of Boba Fett to things that happened right at the end of so many of the episodes and this final episode specifically. Um, Can we talk about it? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, this here uh, we're going to talk about it now. If you haven't seen The Rescue, now's the time to go watch 46 minutes all the way to the end. Please watch past the credits and then uh, come back. But I don't, can I just say, I don't know how you stay spoiler free this long 
after this episode has hit because within hours, like during the day, Friday, mid afternoon, yeah, Nor- Norm, you texted me or ch- hit me on Slack saying, "Stay off, Stay the, off internet, the internet, Jeremy." Yeah, <laughs> and, and and even the people trying to be coy about, you know, I know something like that. Just the the mounting awareness that there is something to be spoiled. I think, right, that was. That took away from maybe it's the the kind of enjoyment of watching the show, and like even like the episode of the Jedi, right? My favorite episode was was the Ahsoka Tano episode. That mm-hmm. episode really didn't have anything to spoil, right? Like the presence of Ahsoka, we all anticipated it. Uh, of course, watching the performance was was great, but there was no like aha plot detail, a reveal, so to speak, and the kind of reliance, maybe not reliance, but like the, the use of reveals and tie-ins to the original trilogy and the kind of fanaticism over that, um, I think was maybe used just a bit too much in, in this season. I think that meant more to people than it did to others, you know, depending on whether or not you knew who she was. I mean, she's not canon from the films, like she's from the, the cartoons. And unlike this last episode, which I think hit home for everybody. But that's, that's, I guess that's the point of like, are you making a show to try to hit home for like old fans, whatever you want to call them? Uh, or, you know, why not introduce an amazing character who is beloved in this animated series and, and develop this character in, in live action? Um, I, I prefer that. Or, or new characters. I prefer that, right? Like the, the IG-11 yeah. portrayal, right? A familiar visage right a form factor and a, and a character design but given a personality that we fell in love with um that's where i felt like the mandalorians show is at its strongest i keep waiting for ig11 to be you know input you know uploaded to a, a new model and get the same character back because i thought he was great too yeah okay so the rescue uh should we just start at the end is that where we're like kind of chomping at no. a bit to talk about or I think at some point we have to revisit like the Mando showdown with Moff Gideon as well, because I do think that's not getting enough discussion in light of the reveal at the end. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's quickly like just talk through the episode, the big kind of moments of the episode. You have a big chase uh, against the Lambda shuttle capture, Dr. Pershing, the geneticist working for the empire, then Boba Fett and Mando kind of recruit the rest of their team with Bogotan. Uh, and there's a nice fight there. I think that fight with Bogotan and, uh, or not, sorry, with Boba Fett and what's her name? Casca Greaves, I want to say. Uh, mm-hmm. That was cooler than, to me, than the Boba Fett destroying the Stormtroopers fight. Um, there's right. more attitude well, it, in that. Right. It, I think it, it had more importance. It it showed that she was a badass. And well, not, not it also pr- made it, sense it, in the context of the characters, too, that there would be a, some bad, bad blood between them. Yes. Right. Like how she it's called her a clone, like the, the whole echoing, you know, the, the, the voice that she, of all the, the clones from Attack of 100%, the Clones. 100%. Right. 100%. But has, has anybody been, you know, stood up to Boba Fett yet up until that moment? Oh. No. Yeah. 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 I, I, I love that fight. Uh, they, of course, with. Um, Fennec, which is uh, Boba Fett's lieutenant, played by Ming Na Wen. Uh, then they go assault the uh, the light cruiser, and it's a great like dog fighting scene uh, where they go into that sh- that shuttle bay. Uh, that was a really really uh, awesome space battle, uh, and then basically it tracks off into the uh, four soldiers going fighting, s- destroying stormtroopers. I thought it was fun. Uh, and then the Mandalorian stormtroopers are just bad at their job. Let's yeah. just let's just call it what it is. They're just terrible at their job. There was no sense of like risk at all in, in that. <laughs> in, in you that knew they were going to make the bridge. Yeah, like, the the biggest hiccup was a, a comedic bit where the car dunes gun jammed, and and that was it. But it really was just it was just like here is that cinematic like you're talking about that larger than life big. Um, showdown where they're just mowing the stormtroopers down and giving every one of these soldiers an opportunity to show off their fighting style uh, and how badass they are okay mando fighting dark trooper one lone dark trooper nearly kills him yes it's like a That's also, fight yes but that the mm-hmm. fact that he that mando is also nearly killed by a single dark trooper also thematically a very important plot point you, you're saying I you're love the, the work for the, the end of the episode. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, I love the punching of Mando's head into the wall repeatedly. It was uh, beautiful, artfully done. Somehow, 
uh, Mando is uh, skilled with a staff, which comes back later as well. Uh, but whatever, we'll just take it. You don't buy that? I buy that. I buy that he's skilled. I mean, with he's it. never held a staff before before this moment, but sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> but but it's made of Baskar, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's it's from his people, and it's the last of the Razor Crest. It's the only I, thing he picked up. Exactly, and and my son saw that coming. He's like, oh, he's going to use that against the dark saber. Um, I I thought that this whole Baskar thing is that what, how it's pronounced? Beskar. Baskar, or Be- Be- Beskar, Beskar yeah. is I like like this is new to me. I I have you heard of this before from the cartoons? I've never once heard of Beskar before, but I, I like it. I like that like they're explaining a special alloy that can deflect laser beams and stand up to lightsabers. Star it's, Wars it's, vibranium. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's it. Why not make a shield out of it? Get a spear and a shield, uh, and. He destroys that one dark trooper. He flushes the rest of them out into space. And then you have the final boss, Moff Gideon. I really love, I thought this was the action climax of the season and and the episode. Didn't you expect Grogu to, to use his force powers and somehow, you know, help Mando at that point, but then he didn't. I like the restraint that they did not do that. But yeah, I was waiting right. for it. Yeah. I love, I mean, first of all, Giancarlo Esposito, just unquestionable acting as any villain in pretty, in pretty much any show. But the way he sort of just coldly laid it out as, as like a lead CIA type would being like, I've expected every single move you've made. <laughs> I've anticipated every single one. I just love the villainy that dripped off yeah. all of those pieces. And then um, just letting Mando go momentarily. I actually believed it. I believe that they had cut a deal um, before the, the saber fight uh, emerges from that. As did Mando. He's so trusting. He's, I mean, but also on guard. I, it called back to the end of the fight in the Jedi with him and Michael Bean and the mercenary who was like, oh, not worth my life. I'm going to put my gun down and walk away. And then, of course, he was betrayed again. And so maybe this was calling back to that and him not, uh, ha- ha- you know, being more suspicious. But uh, yeah, Mando is very level headed. He, he doesn't take it personally. <laughs> Nothing is personal except for Grogu. Right. You never yeah, know that's how much he means to me. <laughs> right. Right. You right. will yeah. never understand. You're using his words against him. Um, I was a little bummed we didn't get like a touching reunion between Grogu and Mando. Oh, uh, but we got a touching goodbye. We did. I mean, maybe they saved it for that. Maybe that was the pacing, yeah. right? And they didn't want to waste that, that the emotional moment in slow motion to have them embrace. But um, it so was. Did you, did you both already know the rule about the Darksaber? No. Okay, that was new. I mean, I it, it's also not made up because, like, that doesn't happen in Clone Wars. Oh. Um, uh, like, it, the dark saber just gets handed to Bo Katan, but oh. so they're gonna have to fill in the backstory of this whole. Like, you have to, you know, earn it and defeat the the person in battle to to get it. There's probably some something they'll explain the backstory between Moff Gideon and, and Bo Katan there that'll explain that he doesn't die. Right, Moff Gideon is the the rare villain who has the plot armor that survives through the end of the episode. So a chance for him to escape, to build vengeance, all of this, the genetic experimentation, the blood he took out of Grogu. Right, what is that supposed to be? They they so strongly, both in the last episode and this one, talk about the galaxy needing order, and so huge nod to the First Order, which is what they're rebuilding in the remnants of the Empire. Still, I thought it was. There's still room for him to have force powers, I thought. You know, he may not have revealed. Odd that he would ha- wield the lightsaber and not have them. You don't need to, I mean, you don't have to have midichlorians no. to Han wield the Solo lightsaber. Han exactly. Solo cuts open a tauntaun with yeah. no force powers. Absolutely. But I'm just saying that there's room for that. Well, and also, if you, uh, there's some dialogue that's kind of um, a giveaway in the episode that Carl Weathers directed where they go to the exper- the base where they see all the experiments and they see the Dr. Pershing recording and it's about using, you know, when they say um, the uh, M cells, whatever it is, M count, right? The midichlorian count. The idea is that they want to experiment and give unnatural force powers to, you know, adults, right? So it's, it's kind of like, you know, how can we, if, if you're not gifted with it, how can we give someone for the right. purpose of evil force powers and maybe that's the, that's snoke 
Maybe that. that yeah, talking I assume about... that was Snoke in the tanks. Yeah, or like early versions of of Snoke. Uh, it, I, I the only thing I didn't like about the the kind of end bit, like leaving Moff Gideon alive, is when he shoots up Bo Katan and then shoot and then you know shoots at, at Grogu and and Mando stops it. Like I understand why Mando's armor stopped it. Why didn't Bo Katan go down? when like Moff Gideon unloads like a lay, like a whole, you know, clip into her. Uh, I, I thought there should have been something a little more staked in that, in a final confrontation there on the bridge. Uh, yeah. And, and the whole thing was after that is when he's real cocky about the uh, dark troopers, you know, banging at the doors and going to kill everyone. You know, his, his just posturing is right at the the peak there when he's like there's only one way this ends all of you dead and me walking out of this room and i forgot about the dark troopers banging on the door what? that was funny like they, they just they, they have like a bang mode yeah like they, they literally go into bang mode and then they just bang 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 maybe that's also why you called it kind of cartoonish is that that's yeah. like a it's kind of a really i mean we've seen smarter droids and robots in star wars like they could have use the the k2so style robot as opposed to the dark trooper i would have believed it right I would have, that would have been really cool to see like a really tall k2so style robot throw mando around um but this is you know and you can see like the the hint, our, our elbow hinges on these dark troopers are very k2so like um the hollow circles but yeah they were kind of they, they look repetitive right they look like copy and paste robots cg robots exactly totally but they serve their purpose yeah they absolutely and the fact that they were cg i i totally let go fine with me because they are so symmetrical and so identical they're just copy and paste and then what all they need to do is stop attacking the door simultaneously and focus in on another direction and they they did that perfectly (laughs) i i will say i was caught off guard when they came back to the ship after being ejected out i did not see that coming um as like a a next step in the story so i again i I think devendra said this a couple weeks ago like feloni and favreau do incredible work setting up mood and scenes and creating like a visual landscape but when you start to like interrogate the writing and like the characters you're like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute like you find all these holes and i think those dark troopers are like a a glaring element in the in the storyline when you examine it them too hard there's a great meme going around the internet right now it's a vintage photo of two kids playing with toy at ads like photo right out of the 80s like these two you know, like a, you know, under 10 year olds and the caption is you know rare footage of favreau and filoni making the mandalorian and that's exactly they're just playing with their star wars toys you know don't worry about the logic it's wish fulfillment yeah. it's like they are yep. they have control of these action figures and let them have their fights uh i agree i didn't expect the dark troopers to come flying back in i thought you know they were disposed of maybe too quickly a little anticlimactic but maybe as a budget consideration but they were really set up like you said jeremy to be fodder to show the badassness of the reveal and the finale uh and just like george lucas did in in episode one they're droids so you can cut their heads off you can slice them right in half you can't do that with the stormtrooper on on screen not on tv all right so let's go to the moment so you hear and see the x-wing come in what was your initial reaction? A single X-Wing? <laughs> How's he going to help? <laughs> I literally had the same reaction as Cara Dune. I was like, I, I thought it was going to be the guy from Kim's Convenience, that guy like showing up. And I was like, what the hell does this do? <laughs> Turn around. And X-Wing just goes, uh, OK, never mind. Let me get out of here. I'll report this back well, to the New Republic. <laughs> it wasn't until it like flew in like so cautiously into the you know, the, the, you know, wing there that I was like, Oh, and then I was like, Oh, it was like all started dawning on me slowly what had happened. Um, yeah. so I was honestly, I, I was stunned when the yeah. X wing showed up. Okay. Yeah. Me, me, I was, I'm right with you so far. I'm totally with you. I, I just like, okay, it's, there's a, uh, one of the rebel Alliance, you know, police cops out doing a drill or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and then it started to dawn on me, okay, maybe. Like, when they stopped, you know, attacking the door and turning around, I was like, well, okay. It's And then my mind starts to go to, could they possibly, like, even get permission to do Luke? 
you know, because we we've all we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, whether or not it would be Luke. Like we we thought there'd be a Jedi, but who? But and who? um, yeah, <laughs> and we you know we we talked about possibly Luke being being a possibility, and, and Norm said there's no reason why they couldn't. But that that is that is something that requires permission from the highest levels of the franchise. Guess what? This is Star Wars now. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the highest levels of the franchise. That's that's what this like really sets up. Like this is no spin-off thing. You know, for all the hundreds of millions it costs to make a, a two and a half hour movie in the Rise of Skywalker, this is Disney Plus is Disney now, is Lucasfilm now, and is Star Wars now. Uh, and that's why they announced 10 shows. So they can do whatever. I think the more important, uh, bigger than the fact of who it was, is the fact that it's telling the audiences, we're not holding back. Anything is possible. We'll show anything. Yeah. Um, I yeah. thought it could have been, I, I think my, my timelines weren't aligned. And so I got really infatuated with the idea that it could have been Ben Solo after, you know, uh, mm. a- after leaving Luke, which would have been like a, like filling the gap between what he did between that and following Snoke, uh, which as a learner of the force and be- Grogu also being a learner of the force, I thought that could have been a really cool dynamic, uh, but it became the most logical thing. Uh, did, so how the sequence played out both through security footage, Grogu reaching out some type of force connection uh, to the slow methodical taking down of the dark troopers very precise, confident lightsaber moves, green lightsaber, hooded figure, a glimpse of that hilt, the gloved right hand, beat by beat, letting you know they're doing this. How did you guys feel? It was when it was the green lightsaber that it like fully dawned on me that it was uh, that. And then the the place my initially went right after that is because soon after the green lightsaber, you see the hallway scene like where he's coming down. And I'm like, Oh, this is the end of Rogue One over again. Um, it is a stunning parallel to the end of Rogue One. And I love the the beauty of the symmetry of that, uh, given that it's Luke and Vader. Yeah, I, I think you and I had like a force link because you and I seem to be acknowledging <laughs> what was what was going on at the at the same points. But I, I still wasn't wasn't fully, fully like ready to to say, okay, it's it's clearly Luke until he put his hood down. Cause, and I don't think that the filmmakers wanted to wanted us to either, like because there's always a chance that they're trying to pull a trick. Because at some point you think, oh, they're they're just they're putting a green lightsaber on there to make me think it's Luke. You know that they're making him do all the moves because they want me to think that. But I'm I'm not gonna fall for their tricks. Um, but of course there it was. Put his, put his, he turned his lightsaber off, even though he has what, six people aiming firearms at him. <laughs> and and then he pulls his hood down. Oh my god! And then and a great disturbance in the force was felt. <laughs> Millions of voices cried out in joy and suddenly tweeted. Well, some in joy. Some, yeah. <laughs> some, some, I, apparently some people felt like the, uh, the deep fake was not as good as they could have done with open source software. Oh, wow. So I know the deep fake is like the, the, the reductive way of describing it. And uh, it wasn't certainly that specific technology. I believe it was a CG model. It was a, a body double with a CG head. So I'm glad they went with, a CG version, which is, I guess, the, the Lucasfilm way with Leia and Moff Tarkin uh, and not a, a Luca-like, if you will. Uh, <laughs> um, Did you do that? I, I, right. I, I've been pocketing that one for a while. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it looked off, didn't it? Like they didn't have him emote very The much, mouth especially. Right? Like it was Mark Hamill's voice. He got screen credit. Um, and was they, it new recording? It had, yeah, I think they mo- did modulation yeah. of his huh. voice. Uh, and he he also confirmed that um, he had kept it, had to keep this under wraps for a year. I so saw he that. recorded, yeah, yeah which yeah. is it's its own form of impressiveness. Yeah, and and even if it wasn't his voice specifically, because it's his likeness, there's that precedent set with uh, Crispin Glover and Back to the Future Two, where you have to give him the screen credit. Hundred right? percent. Like, you don't. You, I mean, there's articles you can find online about the body double and who did the actual uh, physical performance. Uh, but it is Mark Hamill's likeness and character in a Luke that's five years after Return of the Jedi. Very confident Jedi master. I did wonder if they had shot this and in, in, in sort of in the same way that on, that uh, no one else on the set knew the reveal at the end of Empire Strikes Back. 
if they shot this and all the actors were told he's a Jedi, you know, he's and just like gave him some random name or brought, you know, told him it was somebody from the Clone Wars and they all just played it as if, OK, he's just a, you know, important Jedi, very powerful. But they didn't tell anybody else it was Luke un- until like, you know, the post process where they're going through with the editors and the FX makers. R2 was the way guy. it was shot. Could have well, been that but way. They, but R2 only interacted with Grogu. I don't think he interacts with anyone else. Exactly. So a different shot. So I think I think you're right. Um, I, I would say that the thing that struck me beyond like, you know, the, the showing up and everything, I thought the one thing, the one line that was delivered well is when uh, Luke says that he's asking for your permission. Mm-hmm. about grow uh, like that actually hit me a little bit like i was like oh that's like the emotional core of <laughs> of the mando and grogu's relationship right there um and uh I, I was actually honestly touched by that moment uh and then really surprised at r2 i don't know why at this point that i was honestly surprised that r2d2 shows up because of what's <laughs> happened but my mind did not even allow that as a possibility right so i felt like the unnatural joy that everyone feels when you hear r2d2 sound just out of nowhere uh so i i i will fully admit of of just falling into all of the emotional traps they laid for me uh, <laughs> in, in those yeah. like three minutes. Yeah, it was, that, I think that you're at that moment when not only R2 comes up, but Grogu reaching out to R2, like the two things of super cuteness and Star Wars interacting with each other, like that, that, that was quite a moment. Um, but all of that also stands, you know, in, in contrast to the sadness of, uh, mando having to say goodbye and then taking off his helmet to give pedro pascal some room to flex his acting chops that was a that was that's the culmination for, for you to believe a silicone puppet touching the face of a crying adult man is one of the most moving things i've seen on, in star <laughs> wars that's the achievement right there I literally was thinking about that, how people who have no affinity for Star Wars at all, maybe young people or, I don't know, aliens from another planet, if they were to see us watching this and see how (laughs) emotional I was getting about this, what you just described, a puppet and a man and a man taking a helmet off, um, it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, Also, the acting contrast to just a couple weeks ago when he takes off the helmet for the Imperial computer and how uh, unsettled and anxious and worried he is uh, without saying anything. And now the reverse where he's full of of love and emotion and sadness and and loss. It it was an astounding achievement. I, I was thinking to myself, like, did him taking the helmet off earlier this season kind of devalue this moment? At the end, no, because I felt moved. And that's all that really matters. But I, I almost like a little part of me wishes he didn't take off his helmet this season until that moment. But he didn't but in do both it out cases, of necessity, right? Like, he, yeah. In yeah. both cases, he took it off for Grogu. Yes. 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 And he took off his helmet in the first season, you know, when he was going to die. Right, you had you had him battered on on Tatooine. Um, was it Navarro? Uh, uh, Tatooine? I don't remember. Uh, but like after that big stormtrooper battle, uh, so you know he's had his helmet off before. Uh, but this is full on willingness. He did it so that you know his little kid could see him um, before saying goodbye. So, is this goodbye? Is this it? Is there no well, more that- Baby Yoda? Okay, just meta for a second. If it is, wow, is that a gamble on the part of you know the of the the showrunners? Because I, for most people, this is the Baby Yoda show. <laughs> like this is not the Mandalorian. The merch so, says the same. The exactly. So that that's that I, that's bold, and that like that was the biggest twist for me is that they're cutting that storyline closed, and I loved it. I love that they're onto fresh territory. But I, I'm not sure that as if I were a showrunner, if I would have had the guts to do it. I don't think they have the guts to do it. I think that's what they're <laughs> they're telegraphing, and that's why there was speculation with the the one more thing reveal uh, about the, any changes in direction for this show. But I, I think Baby Yoda that- Grogu as a character in the episode hinders the type of episodes you could do 
right? Like you saw that in the, the episode where he had to basically put Baby Yoda in daycare or school, right? There are multiple episodes where you have to sideline him. So you either have to change Baby Yoda, grow him, no longer Baby Groot, maybe Teenage Groot version of Baby Yoda, <laughs> someone more capable, someone who can interact more, right? a new relationship dynamic that builds off the foundation of these two seasons. Um or you have to sideline him for a couple episodes and then bring him back as a very satisfying reunion um, while they get to detour and explore more of the Star Wars universe. I'll say I don't have faith in Disney sidelining a character like this, like a, comp- a company that's looking for profits. But I actually do have faith in Filoni and Favreau doing this. Like they named the show The Mandalorian. Like, like this show is about him. Uh, And honestly, and this is why I think the show should have ended there is like this is the natural culmination of everything we saw from the first episode. His mission was to get Baby Yoda back to his people. And he did that. And so this should be the end. And like the loose thread they have is like the retaking of Mandalore. Like, yeah, but, you know, that's never really been his driving motivation. Or it could happen so, off screen, right? He, he'd find new purpose. Yeah. He's no longer just a, a bounty hunter for hire. He could join Bo-Katan and you know, rediscover his people. Like that could happen off screen as a as an epilogue. Yeah. So I'll say the boldest choice would be ending the show now. I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. But like, you know, for all the reasons, like including they already confirmed that there's another season coming. But this is a really natural conclusion to the story. Yeah. Yeah. I and the asymmetry of of well i don't know if, if the next season would follow man you know mando or if you're saying that they don't have the guts and they'll fo- they'll continue to involve baby yoda somehow like is mark hamill gonna be a part-time cast member what happens there i mean the, the asymmetry of of i i really liked that they ended this with uh luke becoming baby yoda's master you know flipping the 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 master and the apprentice relationship between a Yoda and a Luke Skywalker. I thought that was nice, but I don't need to see that play out any further. No, no. And and we know that Luke is a failed teacher. He's a terrible teacher. I know. Like the canon (laughs) is established in that, in last Jedi and rise of Skywalker, you know, failure is the greatest teacher and he fails in Kylo Ren. He fails all the other, uh, other Padawans. There's no, there's no reason not to expect that he fails Baby Yoda in some way, and Baby Yoda has to return back to his surrogate father. And we were talking about this like the day after we were playing Population One with my son, and and he was my son was like, "Well, wait a minute. What's the logical conclusion? What happens to Baby Yoda? This is not good news, right? Ben Solo kills a lot of Luke's apprentices." <laughs> uh, I, I, There's I only assume. balance with the Force, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I will say uh, on multiple watchings, though, uh, this is much less satisfying. My initial reaction, I watched it on uh, I hit like play at midnight when it came out. How did you know? How did you know to do that? Just because it was the finale? No, I mean, it always comes out at midnight. On I, I know. But do you always watch them at midnight? No. No, but I was just I was up and I was just like, I'm going to hit play in that. And, you know, I just watched it. And so I had one of those like terrible tweets at one in the morning. I was like, holy crap, what was that? They they made this season like I went back to earlier. They made it must see TV and they made it MCU style where if you didn't watch it, the type of reveals they had in store, you know, really rewarded people who had the time to stay up late uh, on this time zone to watch it. Um, which I don't think is the, the best way to necessarily write a show to just make it grounded on these kind of uh, aha reveal moments. Uh, you can have badass episodes and amazing things, but to make a reveal, the, the crux of what people are talking about, it shouldn't be what people should be talking more about, you know, less about Luke and more about the relationship between Grogu and, and uh, the Mando. <laughs> right. So yeah. you, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that they're definitely doing a season three, but at the end of the credits, for the rescue, there is a post credit sequence. Yes, yes. So, uh, which, which seems to imply a different series? It is confirmed that it's now a different series. So the, the, uh, a lot of the speculation was that maybe the Book of Boba Fett 
was the the name of the third season. Like it's an anthology right. show. Two years of following this Mandalorian and two years of following this Mandalorian. Is Boba Fett a Mandalorian? That, answering that question. But no, it's going to be a separate show, but it is the one that we'll see first before season three of Mando. And it's going to come out next, ne- end of next year, uh, helmed by uh, Robert Rodriguez and starring um, uh, Boba Fett, uh, Tamora Morrison, uh, and Ming-Na Wen as Fennec. So it may, I hope it's not just Tatooine. Like Boba Fett never felt like he was only a Tatooine based bounty hunter. So, yeah, it's also a cloud city bounty hunter. That's right. Right. Like, it, but yeah, he hung out at Jabba's palace, him killing Bib Fortuna, like real fun moment. Like that's maybe that's where it starts, but it could be like kind of the, the CD, like what it means to be a crime boss. You know, it's, it's boardwalk empire in star Wars. I mean it, that I love that scene as much as anything in the episode. I mean, to, to, uh, retur- to return to Jabba's Palace, to see how it evolved, to see so many familiar characters, that was an expensive scene to put as a post credit sequence. Again, also good symmetry to Luke descending those stairs and right. everything else. The secret thing is what Norm called out on Twitter, and uh, and I, it like caught my ear the first time through, is he says McClunky, doesn't he? B- B- uh, Bib Fortuna says McClunky. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing yeah. that they made fun of themselves that way. Yeah. Uh, just so incredible. Uh, I, I'm i mildly excited about it. They have to do the Boardwalk Empire thing to make this worthwhile. It can't just be in Jabba's palace and all the crazy characters and Jabba's, li- yeah. Jabba's old life come to life. They have to make it like a real, he becomes like kind of like a, almost a, a not entirely likable mob boss yeah. and i think that's important for boba fett yeah. um well it's also it, it the bounty hunter it, show right it's more like like we got yes. much less of the bounty hunter show in mando after season one but that right. whole thing still exists and that is all we know of boba fett his creed yeah but but don't make me try to like boba fett as like a like a make him redeeming or something like a, the kind-hearted mob boss we don't need that we need like he's a villain let him be the bounty hunter villain. Yeah. I I will say though, uh, just on watching this multiple times at this point, I think there's some sense of disappointment that's settling in to me too about the Luke reveal, um, and it's purely because, it, like, it, it is a dip into the nostalgia over and over again, and like when you take the series as a whole, there's a lot of good stuff there but they dipped into the nostalgia over and over and over again and there's something about it that feels like they're they're about to wear wear through the ice and it's just going to become this like feeling of being in really cold water um that kind of bugs me at at some level it can't become like at some point you got to develop the new characters and and i think the most the things i'm going to enjoy about mando over the long run are some of the new characters the moff gideon Mando himself, you know, uh, even Cara Dune to a certain extent, um, uh, the Carl Weathers character, like all of those things where you're building out uh, new storylines, new opportunities is great. And I find the return to like the old stories a a little less satisfying. I don't know. Overshadows, I I think you mentioned Rogue One. It does exactly what the Darth Vader scene did in Rogue One. It was an exclamation point at the end of a great story. Uh, but I do agree in some ways it becomes a thing that overshadows a lot of the great storytelling that's shown elsewhere. What I what I don't like as much, though, is when they take a bit role and they, they throw it in there for the fans. Like th- That, to me, takes me more out of it than something like this, which you don't expect. You don't expect the protagonist of Star Wars to show up in this series. So that, that like to me, it's, it's slightly different. But I also feel like this is well earned and and they get a huge pass because we never got to see this we never got to see luke skywalker kick so much butt as after the fall of the empire like this is like peak jedi period and in some ways what we hope to see luke skywalker do in in like the the ninth star wars movie um you know and so i i just feel like that like filoni uh, and everybody, they knew that, and th- th- they gave us this scene to sort of give us the Luke Skywalker experience that we that we always wanted. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I think they're very cognizant of that. Uh, this is the right time period to do it. They had no other 
time period to do it. I think it doesn't diminish the character of Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi because that is 25 years after this and there's a lot that can change and maybe the interesting thing if they want to explore that further is what what you know how did Luke go from where we saw him in Mando to where he is at the uh at the end of Force Awakens. Um okay, that's it for our Mandalorian season 2 Spoiler talk, uh, it will be over a year, I think, before we can talk more about Mando, before there's more to know, but of course there's so many TV shows. So let's switch gears. I don't have a musical cue here. Cue, 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 cue here. Um, Christopher Nolan! <laughs> but let's talk about Tenet. Let's try to understand Tenet. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, you can go rent it or buy it. Uh, rent it soon, <clears throat> you can buy it now. It's on Blu-ray, it's on DVD, it's on Apple. Um, and... It's the long-awaited. It's been out in theaters for a while, also. Uh, long-awaited, you know, big, mind-bending blockbuster from Christopher Nolan after he did Dunkirk last, Interstellar before that. Uh, but really, this one shares most DNA with probably Inception, which is a high bar. Many people's favorite Chris Nolan films. Uh, it stars John David Washington uh, as a CIA agent who is uh, tasked with saving the world uh and uh some crazy time space physicsy plot device that allows him to do that that's also the threat so how do we want to begin do you want to start with questions I, about the story well, i don't think kishore and i understand this movie as much as you, you yeah i think i think we have to first entitle this whole section spoilers question mark because <laughs> yeah. i don't know what the heck this movie is about i i mean like first of all we should do like high level reactions did did you like this movie? Uh, did you not like I'm left more as a question mark. I like I'm I'm left not really knowing what I saw. Like at points I was like, this is really interesting. It's visually great. And then there was a bunch of other times I felt like annoyed and just taken out of the entire uh, plot. You know, and- <laughs> I, I agree, because as much as Inception is about dreams, this movie felt like being inside a Chris Nolan dream where it's more about the impression I was left. And he's publicly talked about this. He wants to be like an impressionistic director where you, you watch these big sequences and you have these emotions and thought processes and like aha moments. But at the end, you're not meant to really pick apart the details. If you, once you start trying to say, how did that happen? Or what did they have time to go do this and get those cars and do that? Then it, it breaks down. I I also felt like most of the movie was very arrogant in how it was uh, it came off. It felt like I was in I mean it's funny you say impressionist. At points I felt like I was in like a high-end art gallery where it's like it's about the brush strokes you don't see. And I was just, oh. <laughs> I was very confused by this entire experience. And I'm a I'm a big Chris Nolan stan. I like m- most of his movies uh going all the way back to Memento. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the big let's let's uh, just lay it out there. The big conceit of the film is that there is a technology that allows to uh, people in the future and the present to invert the entropy of objects and people, and therefore sending those people and objects backwards in time. So time is linear, but from uh, the perspective of an object or a person who's gone through this device called the turnstile, they then start going back in time and experience time in reverse uh, while they perceive it as going forward and while the world for them is going in reverse, but going as we perceive it linearly. Very good. Very good. Yep. Yep. The science checks out. I mean, science really doesn't check out. (laughs) <laughs> but and I think they acknowledge that. But that's like the the sci fi book, right? If you think of it as like a conceit in a novella or a sci fi, you have to take that for granted and take the exposition they give you, where you have this classic, you know, like an Inception, where um, Elliot Page is getting explained to the uh, how the the dream devices work. Here you have John David Washington also going through like, well, pick up the object, try to pick up the bullet. It's instinct, right? Oh, yeah, that bullet, I was going to drop it anyway, and so that's why it flew in my hand. It doesn't really make sense, like, if if you think about it. Yeah, and this was my big problem, and I think maybe annoyed is the right word, 
is that I, I felt like in a typical, like in, in Inception, for instance, I feel like that's an interesting conundrum. It's a, it's, it's a difficult, there's several concepts to graph, multi-layered dreams happening, affecting the perception of time, you know, every time exponentially. And you have to sort of figure out the reality of, of the movie. And uh, can you guys hear this alarm? Yes. Hold on. Alexa, stop. And in, that's in the same kind of sense as a good mystery, where they put all the details in front of you, and if you're keen enough to pick them out, you can sort of start to assemble it in your mind. And at the end of the movie, if you're on top of it, you figured it out right along with the inspector. Fantastic. That's a great feeling. And even if you didn't, you can then go back and piece it all together. Right. That's, to me, like, that's great filmmaking and that's inception in many in many regards this i didn't feel like it had that i felt like it was just confusing for and that they and who cared like it, if you didn't understand what was going on that's your problem like it, there weren't enough clues or there wasn't enough you know exposition to sort of give you the tools that you needed to appreciate the film and i think part of that is the conceit itself is so high concept requires so much of a a mind bend like we can't we it's tough for us to think in reverse to talk in reverse to to mm. to understand that uh the i did watch it twice and the second viewing i made a, I, I did have to think about it and it made a lot more sense why the two protagonists came out of the turnstile at the same time um and there's a balance of like how much exposition do you want to put in like do you spoon feed i think christopher nolan as a director and writer it always errors on the side of not spoon feeding because he wants people to feel confused he wants people to rewatch it to feel self-satisfied with having their head wrapped around it but here it was like some of the head wrapping I think still doesn't work, you know, even as much as I've thought about it. Uh, the Kenneth Branagh scene where you first see his perspective, what it feels like for a person to go um, through a turnstile, that really helped click for me. Um, it's like right in the halfway point of the movie uh, where uh, where like what's actually going on. So the over the big plot is that in the future – you know, it's another environmental crisis. The world is to waste, but there is a technology that allows the future to send things and and people to go going backwards in time. And what they want to do is they want to destroy the past. So there's this whole talk of the grandfather paradox of like, well, they destroy the past. You know, maybe they won't exist, but they're like, wait, they don't care. They're nihilists. You know, uh, they 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 think that even if they reverse the entropy of the universe, uh, they'll still survive. And they'll create a new timeline or something <clears throat> where they can overwrite, I guess, right? The, the earth will continue getting younger and they'll have a new world to live on and they'll overwrite their own past, which is us in the present. Uh, and, um, and it's a big F you to, to, uh, to their, their grandparents and to, well, to their four, forefathers who laid waste to the world. Just to simplify, aren't there two camps in the future? One who think if they destroy the past, they'll survive, and one who thinks they won't? Yes, and, and, and the ones who think that they won't survive, that, that they think they'll end, annihilate the universe, is the tenant organization, right? Is yeah. the people trying to stop this. And, and so the idea of, you know, you can communicate with the future by just – you know, um, by uh, posterity, writing emails, burying something, a time capsule of any message of any kind, as long as no one finds it, will be received by the future. Uh, that has a lot of, it reminded me of um, Looper. Bill and Ted. Oh, yeah. Looper. I'm Bill and Ted also, right? Put the keys. I'm going to put my keys right here. All I do exactly. is remember to go back in time and put the keys right there and we'll get out. It's it's that version of time travel, right? It's deterministic. It's a deterministic. Determin yeah. Yes, yes. Deterministic, like there is no free will, and they have that conversation. And you know, it's yes, we make decisions, but we everything that's going to happen is bound to happen. You just have to follow the motions of it, regardless of how complex and time travelly and backwards and forwards. Um, the thing that really helped me understand what was going on is the idea that when you go through a turnstile, you're zigzagging, right? So you're going linearly forward in time. The moment you enter turnstile, you then start going backwards and for you to continue back you have to zigzag again and so at that point that's why there are multiple versions of you because you're kind of stacking yeah. on top 
So I don't think the technology part or that even all the time travel part is the problem with this movie. I, I can accept like there's the turnstile idea and concept and I don't need to figure everything out. The problem, the main problem I have is you have um, an antagonist in Kenneth Branagh who has this sort of nihilistic version of the world. Um, but we never connect to his motivation much. Like he just is like, I got pancreatic cancer from uncovering this thing. And like, I'm going to use this algorithm to rewrite things and I'm going to make it poetic by doing it at this moment of my choosing. You know, it. I never get this clear articulation of his motivations for doing this. And therefore we never get the protagonist's motivations for doing this. And so the story I would have, uh, that I think I actually hope for, is if we put in contrast the development of uh, Kenneth Branagh's motivations going from starting at the nihilist that he already is because of time travel and moving backwards to where who he was at earlier in time uh, before he gets like the pancreatic cancer or something like that. And we start with the protagonist that doesn't know anything about any of this stuff. And he moves to the point where he starts Tenet at the end of the film, right? Like, there's what? this... Oh, like it gets in, indoctrinated. Okay. Or he he creates Tenet. Like, the idea is that it's... A, I thought the implication is that he founds, he founds the organization. Tenet. Yes. I exactly. thought Tenet was created in the future. Right, by him. Yes, by him. Oh, my God. It, it's a pin, uh, it's a temple so pincer movie, they, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, right. The yes. whole movie is a pincer. And so that's it's what a it, palindrome of a film. It ends where it starts. Yeah. But I think that's the story they should have done. It should have been revolved around those two main characters and their traversing their journey. And you understand their motivations. Maybe you understand them a little clearer afterwards, but you understand their motivations. You, what you're saying points. is and all these other you want a character development. Which is like the one yeah, thing the movie and there lacked. was none. There was none. None of the characters had development. All you had was, I think, Kat. Her motivation was wanting to save her child, her hate, but her husband was going to die anyway. So, like, she had the most character development, but in many cases, she was just there to be a damsel as well. It, and do we think the child grows up to be Robert Pattinson? Is that like the implication? I think so. It's not. I mean, it's the by far the most popular theory on our tenant. But it's not because watching it the second time, there is no emotional connection. So this is Robert Pattinson playing the Neil character, the the buddy of uh, John David Washington. I think a lot of what makes the film worth watching is their chemistry. I think they have a great chemistry, the great swagger, great lighthearted moments. Um, but you know, Cat uh, um, uh, Elizabeth Debicki's character, who has a kid, Max, um, who's just a school kid in the movie. Uh, a lot of people postulate, oh, two young men, one with, you know, they both kind of blondish, blonde hair. Uh, they must be the same, right? Uh, it would be poetic, sure, if he came back in time from the future after being recruited in the future to save his mother. Uh, but there are moments where, like, she's shot and you don't get, and if there was any bit of a intention for that, Chris Nolan would have shown some of the reaction, would have given us more. Uh, but I think it's a stretch. It's a reach. Yeah, I, I would say the the thing that made the whole Neil protagonist relationship challenging is we've seen that story told in other science fiction. Uh, I think well done in Doctor Who when it, there's Doctor Who goes through time and he meets this woman, River Song, and um, they play out their romance through time, but they meet at different moments in time. And so the they know wife. So time travelers. Wife. Yes. Yes, they know different things about each other at the wrong times, mm. but she has like kind of a long view. So she's like the Neil character and kind of has to hold some secrets so that certain things develop in their relationship. But um, we, like we got a taste of that in Neil, but we didn't really get it revealed until like, hey, what's that on your backpack? And then we get all of it in like a dump. It's, it's my I was favorite like, keychain. I've had this it was like, forever. <laughs> no, it's not standard like, issue. Come on. Let that let that breathe a little bit. Let that character development happen. Yeah. Like there's a good movie in here if they take out a bit of the action. Because like the whole like car chase scene with Kenneth Branagh, I thought I didn't see that coming. I thought that was good. The airport stuff was visually oh, pretty right. stunning. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Uh, and the it, temporal pincer at the end was kind of intriguing. I didn't know what was going on. Couldn't tell. So it was interesting to watch. Yeah. But there is nothing connecting any of that stuff. Right. Totally totally with you. You know the airport stuff was real. They really did that. With they the crashed airplane. an airplane, a 747, into a building. Not from the air. Don't be so dramatic. Right. I mean, the gold <laughs> was dramatic. But, uh, but uh, can, yeah. Can we can we also talk about the audio for a minute? Like terrible. Like, was this a rough cut? Like, did they not test this? Like, the very uh, strange. I understand. Like, if your characters are wearing masks, it makes things more difficult to record live. But there's such a thing as ADR, and I don't know why. Like, people didn't call this out as a serious problem with the film. I, I think there's bill billboard going up that says "mixed on an iPhone" uh, <laughs> soon. Uh, it was off. I mean, I listened to it in a nice sound system, and I couldn't understand half of this movie. We uh, turned on the subtitles at, for the last act. Yeah, yeah, we did too for the whole movie. Uh, just because, I mean, the, the, one of the rare things where as much as I wanted to see this on an IMAX screen, I think the whole film is filmed with IMAX cameras on film. Don't let you, don't forget, Chris Nolan loves film. Uh, the, one of the benefits of watching it at home is turning on the subtitles, and that really, really helped. Uh, there was a... The Oslo airport, the um, the fight scene in the turnstile where he's fighting himself, like it just sounded terrible. Like the they didn't use Foley, and I want to say they did that intentionally. Where when reverse protagonist was like knocked against a wall, you know, it was reverse entropy, and so you didn't get the sound from him. But I, I don't, I don't right. know if that was intentional or not. I know what you mean. Yeah, I can't talk about this movie anymore. It's just making me <laughs> furious. This is making me furious. I, 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 I do have to jump here. Yeah. Jump here in a minute. Um, all right. So we'll, we'll <laughs> I think we, we all get what tenant was going for. We get the conceit. Like it's not as heady. I think, you know, it does require a little bit of thinking of it. Uh, there definitely was back of the envelope drawing of diagrams. Uh, there's plenty of great YouTube videos out there for people trying to unpack it. And, and, and if you watch behind the scenes, they did show, um, uh, previous, they had their previous team, map out where everyone was at each point in time and so they did think hmm. those things out uh but yeah i think it falls short of his high marks the prestige inception even dunkirk um, in terms of timey wimey stuff all right that does it for our podcast this year Whew, we got through it 2020 guys well done yeah well done this has been you. a weird year it has been a weird year but i'm glad we made it through um We'll talk New Year's resolutions. We'll talk things looking forward to in the new year in our first episode of the new year uh, in two weeks. We'll be off next week. Hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas holiday, however you guys are celebrating it. Stay safe. Um, don't go outside if you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's a little much, but uh, mostly thanks for listening. Thanks And for take listening. care of yourselves. Yeah. And, and you guys as well. It's good to see you guys both. Jeremy, I'll probably see you in population one before day's end. <laughs> Where we, we can get within six feet of one another. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. Uh, here's an outro from Great Job. Once again, have a wonderful new year. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Uh, but with that, we'll say goodbye because there will be no outro this week. I hope you enjoyed the testies, and we'll see you next week. Adios. Bye. Perfect. See you next time. <laughs>